Well, Val Coleman, uh, this is the uh, year marks the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Norway in May of 1945, from five years of uh, occupation by the Nazis. We did not want this important um, milestone to go by this year without acknowledging and celebrating the important event. Today, the uh, Norwegian American Chamber of Commerce, Mid-Atlantic Chapter, the Norwegian Society and Church Service, Washington, D.C., and the Washington Lodge of the Sons of Norway are hosting this special Zoom celebration to acknowledge the courage and sacrifices of Norwegians, especially our members and relatives who were in Norway during the liberation. During the frightened times of World War II, all Americans were relieved and joyous at the liberation of Norway. I would like to acknowledge that we have people from Norway participating today, as well as across America. We, uh, in the formal program today, I just want to note that we will have some small group breakout sessions where you'll be able to interact with the, uh, the speakers. And I would like to note too that uh, we are taping this program. You'll be able to uh, find this on the uh, Washington Lodge YouTube um, channel. And there will be links on the Sons of Norway webpage as well as um, the Sons of Norway uh, Facebook page. Today, we'd like to start the celebration with the invocation by Wally Jensen. He's the pastor of Norwegian Society and Church Services. Pastor Jensen. This is the pastor of the Norwegian Church. Lord, we are gathered to celebrate and to give thanks for the liberation of Norway 75 years ago. Be present with us as we mark this important day in the history of Norway and the world. We thank you for raising up women and men of courage and commitment during our darkest times. We bless those for keeping the lamp of freedom burning and for igniting hope in the hearts of all. Today, we name only a few in remembrance of the many who stood up against oppression and injustice. King Haakon VII, Carl Gustav Fleischer, Berger Eriksson, Max Manus, Leif Larsen, Joachim Röneberg, Gunnar Sundstebi, Oivin Bergraf, Anna Sofia Ustevet. With these Norwegian heroes and countless others whose mantra was Alt for Norge, we thank you. Help us to keep in our hearts and minds the awareness that freedom bears a heavy cost. Remind us also that peace is not simply the absence of war, but also the presence of justice. Inspire and empower us to continue to strive for justice, for mutual respect, for freedom and love for others, and that in so doing, we may achieve a just and lasting peace. This we ask in your most holy and sacred name. Amen. Uh, Chloe, do you want to give the introduction to the principal speaker? Absolutely. Thank you, Dave. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our uh, Colonel Hovart Kleberg. Um, he was a op his operational background includes a maritime helicopter pilot with experience from the high north through operations from Norwegian Coast Guard vessels. He also has staff experience from Defense Staff and the Ministry of Defense, mainly in the Department of Security Policy, but also in the Department of Long-Term Planning. Colonel Kleberg's academic background includes research fellow at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs and Institute for Defense Studies with a PhD in history from the University of Oslo. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Colonel Kleberg. 
Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, Director Freeberg. Uh, dear President of NACMA, Idar Bolnes, President Brown, President Severson, Pastor Jensen, Ms. Oakley, dear friends, both American and Norwegian. It's a great honor and pleasure to join you today on behalf of the Norwegian Embassy in Washington, DC. What we are celebrating today is the end of the Second World War in May 1945. To Norway, the liberation 75 years ago was the end of five years of war and Nazi occupation. It is important to remember the sacrifices that won the freedoms we enjoy today. World War II cost a lot. Cities and communities were destroyed. Many lost their lives. The number of Norwegian lives lost during the Second World War is more than 10,000. The merchant fleet lost approximately 3,800 sailors at sea. Relations were broken, confidence was shattered, the wounds were deep and marked families and nations for generations. I would like us to make, take a minute to recall an extraordinary American sacrifice made by US sailors off the coast of Norway in the winter of 1945. Henry Bacon was a US Liberty ship, one of almost 3000 built during the war. While the ship itself may have been ordinary, her crew made her extraordinary. On February 23rd, 1945, the ship was transporting very valuable cargo. 19 Norwegian refugees making the dangerous journey from the Arctic Russian city of Murmansk to Britain. The Norwegian refugees had fought, evaded, and barely escaped from Nazi occupiers in Northern Norway. Their homes had been burned down, their bodies exposed to the Arctic cold. The last hope was the American steamship. Due to technical issues, SS Henry Bacon was separated from the rest of the convoy and its protective escorts. The ship was attacked and overwhelmed by Nazi submarines and bombers off the coast of Norway. The American sailors resisted and fought bravely for more than one hour. When a torpedo struck the starboard side, the ship started to sink. With only two lifeboats available, Captain Alfred Carini faced an impossible decision. Who should have the chance to live? The decision was to leave the lifeboats to the Norwegians. 22 Americans were lost, 19 Norwegians were saved. I wanted to tell you this story in gratitude and as an example of heroism and to exemplify that great deeds can happen in the most desperate of times. This story continues to impress and inspire and to shape our view on the importance of having allies. In May, 1945, a short while later, came the end of the human suffering and sacrifice of the war. And a brighter future was pointed out. As a military officer, I would like to emphasize two fundamental experiences that shaped our future. First, in April 1940 and the following months at the beginning of the war, Norway suffered defeat following the strategic surprise by an overwhelming Nazi force. After the liberation in 1945, therefore the new slogan which shaped the armed forces for decades to come was never again. Norwegian defense could never, should never again be as unprepared as it was before the war. 
we developed our services in a way that allowed us to mobilize soldiers and material in the frame of the total defense if threats should arise. Second, in April 1940, when the war came to Norway, we were neutral as a nation. This policy did not protect Norway from Nazi attack and occupation. During the war, the Norwegian government established offices in London and the Norwegian armed forces fought alongside allies, both at home and abroad. After the liberation in 1945, the new slogan for the policymakers was one for all, all for one. Norway learned that our defense depended upon allies. We joined the North Atlantic Treaty as one of the 12 founding members in 1949. Our remembrance today is to celebrate the effort and courage that pointed out a new future. In the military, the main lessons was to prepare our armed forces and to make sure we kept our allies close. The US soon proved to be our most important ally. I would like to quote a very recent American Secretary of Defense, James Mattis. He has repeatedly emphasized the strategic importance of strong ties with friendly nations. He has said that nation with allies thrive and those without them wither. Norway had to rebuild the entire society after the war. The US Secretary of State, George Marshall, launched the European Recovery Program to restart the European economy. From 1948, also Norway was among the recipients. The US from the 1950s also contributed to rebuilding the defense forces in Europe through the weapons assistance program. Norway received, among other items, a large number of combat aircraft through the 50s and 60s. Throughout the Cold War, the links between the US and Norway grew stronger. The partnership between our two countries is based on mutual interests, common values. The relationship is built in the idea that American and European security are inseparable. Many claim that our relationship today is closer and stronger than ever. As a small nation of Atlantic orientation, we will preserve our close ties to the US. We cannot exclude that our freedoms will be challenged again. It is our hope that close ties to our allies will serve to scare potential aggressors off and preserve peace and liberty. Today, we celebrate our peace, freedom and government. Those were major outcomes from the Second World War. By recalling the sacrifices of the past, we will move toward the future together with an awareness of what matters to us. The stories from the Second World War have important messages to tell. The war wasn't, was vast in its cruelty and horrors. We have to learn from history and we cannot learn if the facts are wrong. Sir Winston Churchill had the following view on the importance of learning from our experience. Those who fail to, fa to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Remembrance is important to remind ourselves of the cost of freedom and the value of peace and democracy. So let us continue to wave our flags in gratitude to those who sacrificed so that freedom and democracy could prevail in our part of the world for the last 75 years. And let us wave our flags while we continue our work 
for peace, stability, and prosperity together with allies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Colonel. I appreciate your, your words and uh, very much. I would like now to have uh, Bill DeRoche, who will, who's the program director of the Sons of Norway, to introduce um, our other speakers who will have some remembrance and uh, reflections on the Norwegian uh, liberation. Bill? Oh, thank you, Dave. Um, very good speech. Uh, I'm, uh, it is my privilege to introduce award-winning author and historian Janet Oakley, who will speak about Norway during the war. Janet? Well, first off, can you hear me? Yes. So you wanted to thank you for inviting me to speak to you at the uh, 75th anniversary of the liberation of Norway. Uh, it's a really a great honor to be a member. Um, I'm calling my talk a brief history of World War II in Norway, but you know so much is going on, so what can I actually choose? Some history you may already know. I think the King's Choice captured those hectic days when the Germans invaded very well, but maybe there are other things you didn't know or have forgotten. Most of my research has been centered on Trondheim and the islands of the coast of Trondelag um, and the Shetland bus and the resistance in that area. I spent uh, several weeks in Trondheim three years ago to work on the sequel, but um, uh, I'll be, so I'll be sharing a number of things. I did go to the Resistance Museum in Oslo and um, spent a lot of time there as well. You know, as an historian, sometimes I have to look at the hard stuff too. So there are hard things in my presentation. But I'm reminded of one of the pe first people I interviewed. Uh, he was from Trondheim and he had been a carpenter. And he said, you know, uh, one of the most important freedoms, it's the fifth freedom. Uh, and it was the freedom to trust. The lack of the fear of not being able to trust your neighbor really wore down on people. And I think of him often uh, with that quote, the fifth season of, you know, thing is, um, to trust. So here's a brief history of Norway. This uh, monument uh, sort of shows it all. It's on the way to Roros in Norway, which I visited with my host. So the attack was absolutely a big surprise, um, very well coordinated. So Oslo, Trondheim, Bergen, Stavanger, and other places uh, were all attacked all at once. And in Trondheim, my uh, my friend, one of my interviewees, he said, you know, I was a carpenter and I was a journey carpenter and I was on my way to work and there were all these soldiers hanging around on the, on the dock and he had no clue who they were. And these photographs are from April 9th. Uh, the, the Germans have arrived in uh, Trondheim and people are going like, well, what is this? It was just a total surprise. So uh, the same day, the leader of the National Sondling, Norway's um, pro-Nazi party, Quisling, met with Hitler uh, earlier in December in 1939. And then in uh, the, uh, 1940, like just days before the invasion, he was ordered to Copenhagen uh, to meet with Nazi intelligence agents. And a lot of stuff wasn't known at the time. It came out, I think, in the trial. Back in Norway, he's back there in April 6th. At 7.30 in the evening, he got on the radio and proclaimed himself the new government as prime minister. Of course, King Hawken uh, rejected this plan uh, for the new government. He had already fled Oslo and was on his way to um, head of the troops. Meanwhile, Hawken is, they've gone north and then they're pushing up through the center of the Germans. They pretty well have overwhelmed all the ports by this time. So the fighting is going on in the interior although later the uh, British and French will come in, Poles will come in and try to stop the advance. But on the way up, there's a lot of damage going on. Um, this is on the way to uh, Roros. The Germans are pushing through the center of the country and the devastation as mentioned earlier was terrible. And um, 
it took a while. Actually, some right away, the news information got out almost immediately on the wire. So in May, um, this was a, published in the uh, Illustrated London, showing the damage that was done. This is in uh, Namso, and this other one is, uh, these are both Namso and um, another area. But the one I found intriguing is that actually the same month, Life magazine also showed how the um, the action in Norway was published in their uh, magazine, I think in April 1940. And it's several pages I have, uh, I found this at our local archives. So the last stand is the allies and British and Poles, they fight against alongside the Norwegians and Narvik. But then they had to withdraw to go back and protect their own countries. So June 10th, it's over, Norway is occupied. So what was life under German occupation? This is Trondheim on the, uh, the old bridge that goes into the center uh, where Nidros Cathedral is and all that. And um, immediately, uh, Joseph Tobobin is arriving in Norway. He's coming here on April 24th. He's a per personal friend of Hitler and he was brutal. He had a, even though he's not in charge of running the civilian side, uh, he had all these um, men, and, and including the secret police. Quisling uh, was, well, he found out he was not effective. So he was kind of pushed aside, but he will become prime minister in 1941. So right behind the troops comes the Gestapo. This is uh, Victoria Teresa in, in Oslo. And this became the main headquarters. But this photo on the right shows German soldiers arriving on April 9th. They are taking over the Phoenix Hotel in Trondheim. And eventually they will also take over the Mission Hotel, which was a horrible place. Uh, they tortured people there and all that. And it really shows for Trondheim, it was very strategic. They really wanted this area. It's a beautiful area. It's the bas uh, breadbasket of the area. And of course, major um, U-boat pens were, were built the Tirpitz was here and many other uh, warships that would go out and attack these convoys that, that was talked about earlier. So what it was like for ordinary people? Well, right away, you couldn't sing the national anthem or fly the flag of Norway. You had to have passes to move from one to place. This included an ID card. And if you might be in a mountain area, you might have a specific pass that would allow you to go in there. In addition, anyone with a disability, such as deafness, you needed a medical card for exemption from an opposed labor project. And what that means is that this gentleman that I interviewed, he said, you know, in Trondheim, they put these lists up and it's like for 16 to 65 year old men, you had to go look at those lists. And if you didn't show up, you'd be in trouble. In fact, he got in trouble because one of his last jobs, which was about January of 45, it was to build a building that had four walls. Three of them were wood, the fourth was concrete. And he knew that was going to be something for uh, killing people. So he left and got away from Trondheim and eventually got it over into Sweden, which is another long story. Uh, radios are, con you know, they're collected immediately. Newspapers um, were, could only carry NS News and many of the newspapers just quit. They were not going to do this. And any kind of broadcast from BBC or underground newspapers, you could be put to death. English and American movies, plays, and books were forbidden. And spot checks could be set up anytime. They check for your ID. You're coming off the ferry and you have to show your ID when you come off the ferry. You can be arrested anytime. <clears throat> also for ordinary people, immediately, you know, you have this long coastline in Norway and fishing is extremely important, but they imposed a 50 mile limit under the pain of death. You had to carry this poster in your, your fishing boat. And rationing was very strict right off the bat. There were cards for sugar, coffee, all the way to bicycle tower. And their women complained of, you know, they didn't have regular cloth. Sometimes it was made of cellulose, which really crinkled. And I guess it smelled bad too. So um, these are some examples of different um, things. This is people lining up in Oslo for uh, rations. So part of this immediately, you know, the National Songling was only a couple hundred people, but by the fall of 1940, you had 22,000 people that belonged to this. And these are the uniforms of the Hirden. This is the young girl's version of it. And we've got them marching. I believe this is Oslo. They had their own newspaper, the Fritt Folk. Uh, in 1941, the Vikshir, they were just called 
period mostly, uh, was given police powers. And then eventually they were armed. And often they uh, guarded prisoners in concentration camps and on the Swedish border. So in the first fall, the crackdown on labor unions began. A couple of labor unions leaders were executed. The students at the university rebelled and so the society was shut down. All the sporting organizations were Nazified and of course no one would show up. You wouldn't dare go watch a soccer match, uh, you know, something that was done by the National Sondling, and which really irritated people. And the rationing got worse. Henry Oliver, and you cannot, I focused on him. Uh, he was from the North, but he's very strategic for going after uh, all the resistance group. He was recruited very early on, even though he shot, uh, he worked in the, uh, drove a truck, I think, in the Norwegian army during the initial invasion. And he ran a torture chamber in Trondheim called the Cloister. Over a thousand British agents and US things went through it until liberation. It was absolutely horror, horror place. His group had, sad thing, he had 70 male and female Norwegian agents on his payroll of 75,000 a year. And then he would bring in what he called negative agents. These are innocent Norwegians who actually thought they were working for the resistance and what they were doing was betraying their, their friends and neighbors. And he was Norway's number two war criminal after Quisling. He personally killed 13 people. Of course, right away, right as soon as the army was no longer fighting against the Germans, the resistance began. And it was organized in, uh, the military organization was Milord. And uh, you'll see the Lev uh, Honken 7 up there at the top, that became a symbol of freedom. Sivorg, it was the civilian side of it, the churches, the schools, and different civilian part of, of they found different ways to, uh, to uh, resist, but in a different kind of way, not militarily. XU was the uh, intelligence op branch, and they worked closely with, uh, initially on their own, then eventually with the British. SEO Norway was developed, um, SIS, uh, these were all intelligent units and also commando units that came. And export was another piece. Um, this is part, I think, of Milord, but they help people, like the sled picture at the top, get people out of Norway. One of my favorite ones I love, I mean, the heavy water thing is thrilling, but I, I'm so in love with the Shetland bus. It's an amazing thing. And one of the mistakes that, um, that the Germans made is that all the fishing fleets were out. They'd already gone out to sea when they were invaded and they had planned on you know, taking all the major boats. Many of them just went straight to, um, you know, Newfoundland, or they went all the way to, uh, you know, to Baltimore and to New York harbors and refused to return back. So the bus actually started right away. It was originally a little fishing boat, like the thing at the top. That's the Arthur, it was very famous in the early years. Um, by about 1943, uh, the Germans were really catching on to what was going on. So they introduced the um, submarine chasers. They were given three of them, the Norwegian government, the Hesse, the Vigra, and the, um, Oh, it just went out of my head, the Hitra. This is the Hitra now, and that's another amazing story you need to find out about because they restored it and you can take tours on it now. They they would only were working above, I would say above Christiansen. I don't think they went really far south. They were going all the way up past Monso and uh, use different sounds there, but this is sort of the, um, the way, uh, the different tours that they did coming to Zion. Uh, radio operators were very important, um, extremely dangerous job, and they were trained in Scotland and then either parachuted in by um, by free plane or you come over by the Shetland bus. And uh, one of the fun things is that most of the agents uh, had names named after ro rodents. And someone said that, you know, like a lemming, that would be their code name, but they said, thank God I wasn't uh, in the Netherlands because I would be a vegetable. Um, the illegal press also started up right away. And uh, these are all done on mimeograph. And I remember this from you know, elementary school, the smell of the ink of the mimeograph thing. And uh, these papers are actually in the Resistance Museum in Oslo. And uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. They also have children's things in here too that I found uh, just fascinating. Uh, but they would get the word off the BBC and type it up and then send it out. Extremely dangerous work. And I love this shot. This was smuggled out, but this is another way civilians could 
um, you know, do a little bit of um, protesting themselves. Uh, the other thing was using paper clips. We hang together uh, was one of the symbols and there are different ways that ordinary people could do. Uh, they rested a lot of people initially that first summer, but they didn't really establish any kind of concentration camps until 1941. False Dodd was built next, I mean, sorry, Greeny was built next to a woman's prison and then expanded into these barracks. And False Dodd uh, was, which is north of uh, Tronium, uh, is, uh, was established then in a place that had been a boys reformatory. And I had a chance to visit this place. It's very moving. It's now a place for peace and resolution. But I got to talk to people around the area whose parents either were there or they had someone who knew someone who uh, lived in the village. So 42, like I said, there's hard things happening. 42 was the worst year, I think, in Norway. Uh, you still have the diminishing supplies of you know, rations and all that. But this is a time when many of the Mila groups were exposed in what they call a roll-up. Uh, many resistance leaders were arrested, jails executed, the underground papers were exposed, and people were arrested, jailed, and executed. Um, some of the political prisoners were at Greeny, some of them, they were going to think about sending them over to um, Germany. Also, during this time, the teachers' strike, it's an amazing story. Uh, an edict went out, you're going to have to Nazify the schools. Uh, up to 10,000 signed a paper. That should be 10,000, not 100,000. Uh, they signed up to saying they were refused. So they arrested male teachers. Many were sent to Greeny, had a very difficult time. The fascinating thing is the resistance continued to pay the salaries. And then eventually, because people were being so, you know, really tough about it, they sent teachers up to Kirkenes, um, where very hard labor went on. People heard about it, the word got out in Norway. And they were um, they were greeted as the train went north, and eventually someone in Sweden picked it up in a newspaper in Sweden, and once the world found out about it, um, it they won, and they were back to teaching without Nazi doctrine. Uh, another thing that's going on in March '42, the Article Two against the Jews in Norway, they had a very small number of Jews, about 2,100, in uh, August. Quisling gave a speech saying, you know, Norway's right place in the world will be, but it'll be Germany's victory over Jewry. And uh, this was a chapter that's not followed so much, but uh, one thing I discovered in Trondheim, little Stubelstein, these little uh, bronze plaques put in front of a house on the hill going up there, I think it was in Rosenberg, where a family had lived and they had been sent to Auschwitz and died. And it's a project that's going all over Germany, Norway, and other occupied countries. Uh, another piece was the Televog. So Televog is an island on an island south of Bergen. Uh, it was a great landing place for SCOE's uh, Shetland bus. And there was a, a shootout between two agents that were discovered and uh, Gestapo. And the Gestapo men were killed. So Terboven made it sure that the people would remember this. They were getting you know, people were not doing what they were supposed to do. You've got teachers rebelling and you've got all this stuff going on. And so they raised the whole entire village. They burned up all the boats. They separated the men, that's 16 to 65, and sent them all over to Germany. Uh, the women were separated and put on boats. The children for a while were separated from their parents. It was called the Lydis of the North. And it was followed um, uh, in the American uh, newspapers, which I thought was interesting. Another thing that's really more coming to light now is the massacre of two and 88 Yugoslav POWs at Biesfjord, I think is how you say it. And uh, it was a death camp up there. And these men had been brought over from uh, Yugoslavia and sent to work on railroads and barracks in Northern Norway. And they were ex ex executed by their guards. Uh, they were herd members and uh, the atrocity was hu hushed down. But the museum up there in Narvik is wanting seriously to talk about this. The other thing that happened is that Trondheim was kind of like a little rebellious place. And because uh, they had these important U-boat bases there, but people were not, you know, they were kind of going about their daily days, but uh, they finally, there was a big uh, sabotage. So Terboven uh, had, I think initially there's 24 picked, 10 were, 
taken up, uh, arrested, taken up to the Falstead Forest and uh, executed. And Terboven came up on a train, they had a big party and I was talking to the Justice Museum. Um, he's a police advisor there. He said, yeah, they all got drunk. It's just horrible. And additional 34 were executed over the next couple of days. Going there to Falstad was one of the most moving things I think I've done. This is next to the concentration camp. And you walk through the, walk to the forest and you see these little ovalists. They're marking probably, you know, 20 to 40 people in one, one grave. Uh, then in 1942, in the November, uh, Norwegians were rounded up in Oslo and sent to gas chambers of people that were in the middle of the country. They ended up in Falstad and were shot in the forest. And a total of 772 Norwegians went away. This is what's interesting on the left. Uh, what I found fascinating is that the Royal Norwegian Information Service was very active and they would get word out and put it into their local newspaper. So this is quite a detailed thing about how uh, they were arrested and uh, sent out. So the news happened in uh, you know, the 26th, but it's being reported December 4th in the uh, News of Norway letter that went out, put out by the office there. Uh, as we get winding down, jumping to 44, uh, they had a Quisling called up young men born 21, 22, and 23 for Norway's labor service or AT. He wanted to get 70,000. And the big fear was that they would be sent to Germany to fight. And so one of the things that happened, uh, the Norwegians said, get out of there. And in just in Oslo alone, 3,000 went up into the forest, thousands throughout. And then a problem happened because at the time the ration card was given to the family. So trying to um, <clears throat> bring these kids in, you had to go get your own personal uh, ration card instead of the family getting it. And of course, what do you do? You're going to starve to death in the woods. So a big issue was how are we going to um, do this? And um, eventually there is a sabotage raid in which they blew up ration cards. But um, it was quite a difficult decision for the resistance, how we're going to feed them. So as we near the end, uh, for ordinary people, they were so excited when Paris fell. They thought they would be free. And uh, in some ways, some of the <clears throat> resistance groups got a, what my dad would say a little frisky and were taking risks. And uh, that was not a good idea uh, because they were going to be held to, as you know, May 8th is when, uh, when capitulation happened. During this time in November, uh, the, the Germans are being chased by the Russian army into Northern Norway. Most of the resistance in the South didn't quite know about it. There were rumors about it, but it was for several months that they didn't really know what was happening up there. And the for food shortages were very critical. There was a group called the Danish Relief that helped during winter, actually the Norwegian church. I know the, um, the Deaf Church in, Nor in Oslo hid a lot of the food behind the altar. And uh, you can see a button down at the right, which is, um, from the US group, um, which was started up in 1940 to get rations to, to Norway. So things are really critical. And despite the fall of Paris and Allied gains, you know, uh, after the Battle of the Bulge, then the push came. They're really, the Allies are really pushing. The Gestapo and uh, the state police were really vicious in Norway. So finally, liberation came in late April. 1945, you know, after the death of Hitler. But the big question was, you had 360,000 well-armed Germans in control of Norway. And there was a fear that they could go on for another six months. They also had 20,000, 40,000 Russian POWs. And it's like, would the Allies have to go fight there? It was just a huge question. But fortunately, everyone sat down and agreed. And you know, I talk. Janet, thank you very much for the talk. It was very informative. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll have lots of questions for you in the small chat section session. Uh, 
the next part of the program, uh, three members uh, will share their personal remembrances of Liberation Day. Also, two members will share their families' stories about the war. And uh, we will start this portion uh, with a newsreel about Nor Norwegian liberation. confiscated from German supplies provide a treat for Norwegian children. Food they haven't tasted during occupation. And the occasion calls for it too, for the country is celebrating its Independence Day, free from German rule after five long years. 25,000 school children march with flags and serenade Prince Olaf as he waves from the balcony. <laughs> Children who spent formative years under the Nazi heel give vent to leather lung joy on this day of days for them. Norway, a country that refused to bow to German domination, holds her place proudly among free peoples. Okay. Uh, now we will actually ask someone who was there at the time of the liberation, and Eason, to give her recollections and Anne, make sure you unmute yourself. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, I'm Anne Eason and I grew up in Trammen. It's a small town near Oslo and uh, with my parents, brother and sister, and I was nine years old uh, when the war was over. Uh, on that day, May 8th, we woke up in the morning and out of the window, we saw a Norwegian flag, which we hadn't seen for five years, excuse me. And um, my father found the radio that he had hidden away because we weren't allowed to have any radios. And my mother got out the flags. And <laughs> then we all went down into the marketplace in Drummond. It's a big marketplace and with our flags, and um, the, we watched the Germans being arrested and the <clears throat> underground came down from the forest and the mountains. And then we were <laughs> laughing and crying and yelling and waving our flags. And not long after that, we took down the black window coverings that the Germans demanded. This was done so that the planes that might fly over couldn't see uh, any lights. Um, that was May 8th. And we were all very happy. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very nice remembrance. Did you unmute your mic? Yeah, I did. Okay. Thank you very much, Anne. And uh, Sophie Hammer Sophia. It, Sophia Hammer is traveling today. However, I have created a short video from an article she wrote, read by Pat DeRoche. Memories from the Day of Liberation from World War II, May 8, 1945. How can I ever forget that day, even though I was very young, nine years old? The jubilation still rings in my ears. Minesweepers, cruisers, and other military vessels were filling the Stavanger Harbor. Flags flying from anywhere you could hang them. Church bells were ringing and the whole city was on its feet. 
I felt the ecstasy just as acutely as everybody. Downtown, passing the post office, a distinctive corner in Stavanger at that time, I remember a seemingly endless convoy of Jeeps filled to capacity with servicemen, British and American. People went almost wild, cheering and waving, and the soldiers responded just as jubilantly. As in every home, my family had gathered at our house to celebrate. How I came to be out on the street at the same time, I can't explain. No matter, I saw two uniformed men coming toward me. Excited, I walked up to them and invited them to meet my parents. Who was more surprised, the officers or my family, is hard to say. One officer turned out to be Norwegian, the other British. Mr. Uh, Mr. Hooper. So all three of us walked up to the front door and rang the bell. My surprised mother opened the door and of course invited us in. What the gentlemen and everyone else were thinking, I never knew. It was an impulsive outburst of jubilation on my part. Later on, Mr. Hooper became a frequent guest in our home. I especially remember him trying to teach me the word D-O-G, dog. It went totally over my head, not a clue. The streets downtown were littered with papers raided from Nazi occupied offices and businesses. Gone were the days with darkened streets, blockades, barbed wire, air raid sirens blasting in the middle of the night, deprivation of free speech and property the lack of food and clothing, and so much more. It has taken me decades to muster motivation to read about the war, much less speaking and writing about it. Perhaps I had overheard conversations among adults that were not from my young, impressionable years. To this day, I can't bear the sight of a motorcycle with a sidecar or the green German officer's uniform with a turned up cap, and especially not that ever present swastika. Okay. Um, Phil Eckhart will tell us about his father who served in the Norwegian Merchant Marine. Eklund. Eklund. Eskelen, thank you. Phil, can you unmute yourself and start talking? Good. Yes. Good. Sharing my screen? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, today's commemoration would not have been possible without the immense sacrifice of merchant seamen who transported personnel and key supplies to the front lines in Europe. At the start of World War II, Norway had the third largest ocean going and most modern merchant fleet in the world with over 1100 ships operated by more than 30,000 officers and seamen, including my father, Per Eskelen. The Norwegian government in exile established the Norwegian shipping and trade mission that put the entire Norwegian merchant fleet at the disposal of the allies. Until 1942, Norwegian ships carried about one half of the fuel, particularly high octane aviation gas and one third of all the other supplies that was critically important to England's survival during the Battle of Britain. But this effort came at a high price. By the end of the war, over half of the entire merchant fleet, including three of the five ships that my father served on, was destroyed by Axis forces, resulting in the loss of nearly 4,000 lives and about 6,000 sick or wounded, representing one of the highest proportional casualty rates of any allied force. Like many other young Norwegian men, my father signed on to the oil tanker Barfon in Stavanger in May 1939 as a galley boy to escape the poverty of the Great Depression. 
He had no military training and believed Norway's neutral flag would shield him even as the war clouds gathered over Europe. His ship was protected during the Phony War as he saw the scuttled German cruiser Admiral Graf Spee outside of Montevideo just before Christmas 1939. However, neutrality vanished after the German invasion of Norway while the Barfon was in Aruba. My father was now an unwitting but willing combatant in the global struggle against fascism. He volunteered to take a crash course on operating naval guns and eventually sailed across the North Atlantic on the cargo ship Marie Baki as a greaser in the engine room and as a gunner topside. One convoy was seared in my father's memory. On January 9th, 1942, the Marie Baki almost foundered near Greenland after encountering a winter storm. The ship lost all the lifeboats and the aircraft on deck. The lumber cargo also shifted, resulting in such a heavy list that only one of the engines could be used. The captain ordered the crew in their sea survival gear to clear the deck of the loose lumber and fasten the oil drums. The captain shouted to my father and others to hold fast to the rope on the cargo hold every time a big ice cold wave hammered the ship. The weather damaged vessel turned back, avoided a U-boat wolf pack outside of Sydney, Nova Scotia, and limped into Halifax Harbor on January 20th to undergo repairs before sailing as part of another convoy seven weeks later. During this time, my father underwent further gunnery training at Camp Norway and had the good fortune to see Prince Olaf and Princess Martha when they came aboard the Marie Baki the day before the ship set sail again from Halifax to Liverpool. My father never considered himself a hero, but he was proud of his service. After the joyful celebrations in New York on VE Day, my father contacted his family about returning home. They advised him to stay in America because Norway's economy was in ruins and no jobs awaited him back home. So he continued to work for the Norwegian Public Health Service as a clerk, met and married my mother and established a new life and family in New York City. My father was an active member of Norwegian war sailors groups. One of his high points was serving with Carl Andreessen as an honor guard to lay a wreath with King Harold at the rededication ceremony of the Norwegian Veterans Monument in Battery Park. In the far left photo, you can see my father, Carl, and others talking with the king after the ceremony. Today, as we celebrate, let us also take a moment to remember the nearly 4,000 Norwegian seamen who gave their all so that their fellow citizens could be free. Thank you very much. Uh, um, thank you very much, Phil. And uh, our next speaker is Margot Tucker, which will talk about her relatives who are active in the resistance. Margot, can you unmute? Margot, can you unmute yourself and uh, do your presentation? Uh, yes, hi. Um, I have a number of relatives that were um, involved in the war effort. Um, but initially, uh, I have an item of pre-war interest uh, in regard to my mother, Agnes. Uh, she was on a trip in the summer of 1936 to the Olympics in Berlin. Uh, she was a teenager at the time and went to visit a pen pal. And the two 16-year-old girls snuck into the venue for the opening ceremonies. When they came out into the open, they looked up into the stands and saw Chancellor Hitler with all the dignitaries not far above them. Now my parents, John and Agnes married February 10, 1940. They lived in, at the family farm in Aikhoven near Oslo. On the night of April 9, 1940, Norway and Denmark were suddenly invaded. My uncle, Eric M. Zonstad, who was just 18 years old at the time and also living in Aikon, recalled hearing the planes. He saw them flying toward Fornabit Airfield as he looked out the window toward the Oslo Fjord. That day, Eric tried to follow his usual routine. He and his classmates cycled into Oslo only to find that their school was closed. They watched a battalion of German troops proceeding down Karl Johansgata 
and just then a newspaper photographer took a picture. After the war, Eric hung a copy of the picture in his office. He is one of the boys with bicycles in the left foreground. Don't know whether. Yeah, we can see it. Thank okay. you. Um, but afterward, Eric and his friend cycled back to Fornaboo to watch the planes land. On landing, one of his planes slammed into an embankment, split open, and caught on fire. He and his friends were right there and helped to rescue some of the trapped soldiers. This was noted in the newspaper the next day, although the boys were not identified. Sometime later, when word arrived from the government in exile that Norway was not surrendering, Eric managed to, to join the resistance forces. He was given a code name to use and he escaped to Sweden. In Sweden, he was held for a short while under his code name before being freed. He was then assigned as a clandestine radio operator in Trondelag to prepare men and munitions for a possible allied assault in Northern Norway. Eric was later sent to England and Scotland for commando training. This was by means of the clandestine, clandestine crossings of the sea hidden on fishing boats known as the Shetland bus, which we already heard about. This is my uncle. Eric and his team of commandos committed many acts of sabotage against the Germans in Norway, risking their lives constantly. They would instantly have been shot if found. He and his fellow fighters were never discovered. One of the tricks they used to confuse the Germans was to conceal their radio set under the bed of one of the men's mothers. Since she was an invalid, the Germans never looked there. After the war, Eric was highly decorated by both Norway and the Allies. He was made a member of the British Empire with a letter from the Queen of England. He also received a letter of recognition from General Eisenhower. In stark contrast, my mother's other brother, Andreas, was unable to escape from Norway. Although only 22 years old, he was a school teacher. As we heard, the Germans wanted all the schools to teach their Nazi ideology and pressured the teachers to do this. When Andreas and the others refused, they were arrested and put into concentration camps for the duration of the war. A cousin of my mother was Klaus Helberg, one of the six men who took part in the successful demolition of the heavy water plant at the Norse Hydro installation at Ruikan. Both a bull attacked in Norway and a and movie, Terrors of Telemark, have been made of it. My father, John Odo, had been a top student of electrical engineering. He was first in his class at NTH, NTH, the Norway, the Norway Institute, Institute of Technology, Technology in 1937. After, After Norway, Norway was invaded, the Germans, the Germans began rounding, rounding up scientists and engineers, and engineers to help, to help them develop, develop weapons. weapons. Anyone, Anyone who, refused who refused was imprisoned or killed. killed. Word, Word was gotten to him at the farm in a coven by an emissary from the Norwegian underground, and a plan was had been developed to smuggle him and Agnes, his wife of two months across the frontier to neutral Sweden. From there, they were flown secretly to England where John would take part in the development of radar. This was of the highest importance. They could not tell anyone, even closest family, that they were leaving. And they could only take one rucksack with them. They made their way to a prearranged spot where they were met by a guide who took them through the mountains, avoiding German patrols. These German patrols were ordered to shoot anyone found trying to cross the border, so their lives were in jeopardy during the entire escape. Once they reached Sweden, 
they were flown at night by small plane to England. Once in England, he went to Malvern near the Welsh border. He joined the Norweg Norwegian military in exile and became a part of the secret group of physicians, of physicists and engineers where he helped develop ra radar. This is a picture of both my mother and father during that time. My mother, meanwhile, remained in London, where she became a cartographer in the Norwegian Women's Auxiliary, drawing maps for the government in exile. She had stories of the London Blitz when everyone hid in the subway tunnels, and she learned a number of popular English songs of the time. While in London during this time, Agnes and John had a chance meeting with her, with her brother, Eric. This reunion was the first time they had seen each other since the invasion and the first time that they were to know each other was alive. John and Agnes remained in England until the war was over when they could safely return to Norway. It wasn't until the war was over that the rest of the family knew that Eric, John and Agnes were alive and well. My mother's other brother, Andreas, was released from prison after the occupation ended. However, his experiences while in the Nazi custody profoundly changed him. He tried to resume normal life, but never was able to go back to teaching. He did farming and some forestry, living in isolation in modest mountain huts. He also joined a choir that toured multiple countries. This helped him regain some stability in his life but he never wanted to talk about what happened to him in the concentration camp. He visited us here in the US a couple of times and we took him with us when we drove our RV to Disney World and he enjoyed that just as much as our kids did. He really enjoyed his time with us and seeing all of the sights as we traveled across the country. Eric, my uncle Eric, became involved in politics and he was elected to the Norwegian parliament where he gained a reputation as a fiery politician, always looking out for the best interests of the Norwegian people. John and Agnes, my parents, remained in Norway to help with the rebuilding of the country until John was offered a job at Westinghouse. His reputation from his work during the radar, developing radar during the war made him a valuable asset. The family immigrated to the US as a result to take up a new, take up new lives here. And to add a little bit of levity to this, uh, I will just mention something my father said periodically. And that was uh, uh, going back to when he was born, that uh, was right before the beginning of World War II. Uh, I'm sorry, World War I. And when he and my mother married, at uh, uh, that was two months before Norway became occupied by the Nazis. So that's a family history and uh, uh, the connections <laughs> with my father in the beginning of the world wars. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, our last speaker will be uh, Gunnar Grotos. And uh, Yes, and uh, ah, Gunnar. Yes. Um, how are you, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, thank you. And you were you were in Norway when the liberation. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, I I I was 11 when the, we were attacked by the Germans, and I was 16 when when the, we got rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Tell them about the radio when you were a young boy. What? The radio. Oh, yeah. You know that uh, when we were occupied by the Germans, the first thing that they did was to actually confiscate all the radios because they didn't want anybody to listen to London and the BBC news, you know. They want to control the news to all the Norwegians. So you're, you, used to listen to it on you, you listened in the walls. 
Oh, yeah. had it in the wall. I had, I had the radio hidden in the wall so I can listen to the Otherwise, you know, you will be arrested. And this, they actually sentenced some to death that had been listening to right. to to this. And you knew the news before your parents. And you have to listen oh, to yes. your dad tell you. Yes, you know that uh, my my parents didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> so you know, so I had told somebody that I keep in, you know news for, for to actually advise my father and mother about the latest news from London. <laughs> but I never knew they came from me. <laughs> How about the summer cottage in Norway being taken over? Oh yeah, we, we, the cottage we had at Lerve, uh, at one of the islands around Horten. Uh, you know, we had, um, uh, this uh, this chicken. college that uh, uh, they uh, the, the Nazis uh, they took and occupied during uh, the World War Two, and uh, uh, so we didn't have the benefit on them, and they had people there that that didn't have another place to be. And they left the house very bad. Yeah, the house left was left pretty badly. <laughs> Tell them about the Nor uh, the main navy base and shipyard in Norway, in Horten. What, what shipyard? The shipyard in Horten, and and a navy base. Oh yeah, the, you know, in my hometown, the navy the navy had their main base and shipyard, uh, and and they had a shipyard, uh, and the. Ship Shipyard was a was a uh, navy shipyard, and they were building uh, destroyers there. And uh, you know, they went very slowly. They really hardly worked on this ship <laughs> because they didn't want the Germans to put it into their their navy. <laughs> and, uh, the Norwegian underground. And, and the underground eventually, actually. Uh, inoperable, so <laughs> so they couldn't use it. So they nobody could use it. And then tell them about the February twenty second, nineteen forty four, when the Navy and British bombed Norway. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, the British was led by a Norwegian uh, a pilot, and they bombed us in the, uh, for. Uh, February 22nd, 1944, and uh, and that place burned for a for a week or so. And but they it's, and sometimes they also uh, the British, uh, mostly British, but it's also uh, Norwegian pilots. We were looking for submarines, and they got some of those submarines yes, 11 from of time them. to time. Yeah, 11 of them were bombed in the Horton Harbor. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's very, very interesting. So yeah. he, you were very happy in May 8th at 15 and a half, right? Yes. A lot of celebration. And a lot of drinking, he said. <laughs> but of course, I didn't drink. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we believe you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, thank you. Th thank you very much for your remembrances. And uh, I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, all the speakers uh, for their talks. There's a, a lot of great speeches. And we're going to, um, and uh, we're going to have the opportunity to talk, ask questions, and talk to the speakers in the small group program after the formal part of the program. So I am going to turn the program over to Lossie, who will give us our completing our concluding remarks. Lossie.
Are you sure you were unmuted during that? Yes. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that. Did you hear anything? No. Uh, just, uh, no. just from now. No. Okay. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you uh, to all our speakers today. What, uh, what a great job you all did. Um, I also like to say thank you to Sons of Norway for hosting uh, technically this event. And it has been a pleasure to see how the Norwegian organizations here in Washington, D.C., together with the embassy, have put this program uh, together um, to celebrate um, probably one of our families and friends' most uh, significant historic event. Even the current pandemic stopping us from having a physical event, uh, I found this afternoon so important and nice. And I'd like to thank all of you for attending uh, this Zoom meeting. It's not that bad, is it? No. <laughs> we have managed to get together today uh, without any risk of the virus or even the traffic. Mm -hmm. Let us take a moment of silence to remember the ones we lost during the war and show our gratitude for their service. Thank you. Again, Thank you all for being here today, and I hope you will enjoy uh, these small breakout sessions where you have an opportunity to even tell more stories from, uh, from the uh, 1945. Thank you. <laughs>